Hello, my name is Alice, and this is my first speed paint in a long time. As a short introduction, um, I'm 19, I'll turn 20 in April. I'm Swedish, hence all the Swedish names of my characters that you're about to hear. I've been interested in writing and drawing since I was small. And um, these characters that you're about to see on screen are from a book I'm writing. Um, And I've been writing this book for about three and a half years now. And um, (laughs) that's basically what this video is going to be about. I'm going to be drawing the main five characters of the book and talking about them and the book in general. I'm not exactly expecting anyone to watch this. (laughs) This is basically just for myself. This project has been with me for so long now, and it has seen me through some major life changes, you know? So yeah, that's basically the purpose of the speed paint, just going through my project, my characters, a little bit about myself, but not a lot, hopefully. (laughs) And yeah, we'll see where we end up. This speed paint took me about 17 hours over like I don't know how much it was like five consecutive months and that's not because I struggled for like months to get things right it was because um I'm just not very creative at the moment or like I am creative but I'm not at all as good as I have been previously um at just sitting down and drawing and writing the way I used to And um, without going in too much on my personal life, this is because um, I started dating my girlfriend two years ago. (laughs) And a lot of my attention has just been on her, you know? Nothing wrong with that. But it has taken a toll on um, my creative productiveness. So now I'm working to get that back, and I feel like this speed paint is um, a step towards that. But enough about me, let's talk about the project. So the name of the book is Högfaradana, which means the high treasoners. It is uh, a fantasy book that is set in, well, a a fantasy world. The country these characters live in do resemble Sweden in a lot of ways, except for with the regime. Um, That's (laughs) very different. But um, we'll go back to that shortly. So first of all, obviously there is a reason for the title. Um, The main plot is um, people revolting against the crown. More specifically, the main character, Maria, and her husband, Philip. Um, They're both a princess and a prince, respectively, of different kingdoms within this country. And they don't like the way their parents are ruling the country, so they're basically planning to just end the monarchy. (laughs) Now, obviously, there's way more to these characters and the storyline, and I will get into it. But firstly, um, basically, how I got this idea was um, when I started writing this, I was really into historical novels, um, namely, like, Outlander-type-esque novels. Um, If you don't know what Outlander is, it is basically a book series written by Diana Gabaldon. It is a historical novel, there's time travel, there are many major historical events, the characters almost die like a thousand times each. (laughs) It's just something that I'm definitely not the um, target demographic for, but I still like it. Um, And in this novel there is a character who is gay which resonates with me because i am gay hello (laughs) and without too much spoiler there is basically a plot where this gay character has to or is almost has to marry a um straight woman and it's like a mutual arrangement of sorts um and this inspired me i wanted to do like a similar thing but as an entire plot i wanted to have a like gay man um and i was like what what, wouldn't it be iconic if they lived in a time or a place where they couldn't fully you know 
express who they were and marry the people they wanted to marry so they just decide to marry each other to help each other out so basically a gay man and a gay woman marrying each other um through mutual agreement just to help each other out as buddies um but i realized that in order for me to write something like that i would have to do a ton of research because when it comes to historical accuracy i want if i'm gonna write something historical i want to be accurate because i find one of the things that are so fascinating with Diana Gabaldon's uh, novels, not everything is accurate, obviously, but a lot of it is. She does a ton of research for each book she writes. And I was like, I'm just not cut out for that. <laughs> um, at this time where I was thinking about the plot of a new book, I was 16. This was in 2020. I know, the dooms year. So I was like, okay, so I cannot write a historical novel because... One, I don't know how to research. Two, I don't have the energy to research. So I was just there like, okay, um, how do I include historical elements that I like meanwhile avoiding having to apply all of this to historical accuracy? And then I was like, boom, fantasy. I can just write a fantasy book because then I can make my own rules. I can pick and choose elements from history that I want to include without it having to be accurate. So that's basically how this book was born. <laughs> so the basic plot of this book is um, there is a gay prince and a gay princess from different kingdoms within the same country and they decide, well, what do you know, let's marry each other to make our parents happy and to start a revolution, basically. So, as previously mentioned, I started writing this book back in 2020, in the summer of 2020 specifically. I had just finished ninth grade, and I was going into what is called in the Swedish school system, gymnasiet, which is basically where you go after ninth grade. Um, first to ninth grade is mandatory, you have to go to through all of them. But when it comes to gymnasiet, you can choose to go there if you want to, and you choose like a specific thing to study towards, like a, a major, basically. And so this book followed me into starting a com at a completely new school. I didn't really know anyone there, and it was a really scary thing. But I had this book to kind of, you know, steady me. Like, it was a thing that I was continuously working on that would help me take my mind off of things. Um, and you go, typically, gymnasiet is three years. Um, and I went through all of those three years writing this book. And now I'm, as I said before, I'm almost 20. And now I have completed over half a year of university. <laughs> so a lot of time has passed since I started this book. Um, and a lot of things have happened in my life. So this book is very near and dear to me. But um, what I wanted to do with the speed paint and this drawing overall was very slight redesigns of the characters. Um, I can show you some pictures of what they have looked like. Um, I think my the main thing I wanted to do was, um, one, redesign Maria a bit, specifically her facial features. When I started out back in 2020 and I was like 16, uh, my experience with drawing POC people wasn't that expansive. I think typically people are drawn to um, drawing and um, depicting characters that look like ourselves. I had drawn POC people previously in my life, but let's be honest, they mainly looked like white people with darker skin. And there, there's nothing wrong with that. Obviously, there are people that have more like European-centric white centric whatever features um and still aren't white of course that exists but that is i know that is a major problem with white artists drawing poc folk is that usually or in many cases their poc features are kind of erased because the white artist does not use proper um referencing and the white artist doesn't take their actual time to study different POC people um, and identify main features and such things. So I wanted to do a slight redesign of Mariah's face um, and I, I think 
I managed to keep how she looked before, but basically apply some POC features over it <laughs> or whatever. Um, I also worked a lot with lighting and how it hits dark skin because um, that wasn't something I had worked a lot with earlier and hopefully I did her justice. Um, you'll see obviously later in the video how she turned out but um, yeah that was one of my main goals with this video. My second one was to establish outfits in two of the characters who are supposed to be soldiers. I wanted them to be um, like both of them to be kind of obvious soldier clothing but i wanted them to be like different colors and stuff to represent different ranks but you'll see you'll see about that later don't worry about it anyway um enough babbling <laughs> let's get into the actual projects um as a whole i want to talk a little bit about world building because this is something that i feel i have done um on a, on a pretty large scale um, the world has definitely, <laughs> I would say, built itself throughout this project. So, essentially, the characters live in this fictional country called Aros. It is a country that has a history of many, many civil wars and lots of conflicts. So, it is divided into three kingdoms of sorts. Except only two of them are kingdoms, because only two of them have monarchies, but anyway. There is Beriadal, which basically means mountain valley. This kingdom um, is where Maria and her parents are from. She is the princess of Beriadal. Now, the reason for the name for this kingdom is because there's lots of mountains. The, the castle and... The city, or I don't know what to call it, the village, is located in a valley that is surrounded by very high and difficult to get through mountains. But um, there's also residents on the mountains, of course, like sheep herders and such. Now, um, there's not a lot of lore <laughs> about this kingdom that is included in the book, because um, the majority of the story takes place in another kingdom. But my idea about it is basically that they thrive off of um, the mines and obviously stone and stuff <laughs> that they can uh, acquire from the mountains and um, the sheep herding and everything that is going on up there. And that is like their main source of income. The second kingdom is called Skogamark, which basically means woodlands. This kingdom is called that because it has um, a large forest and lots of trees and that is also its main source of income is just wood basically. Now this kingdom is by far the strongest one out of the three. It is ruled by um, Christina and Henrik aka the king and the queen and they are the parents of Philip who is uh, the gay prince I talked about earlier. I will um, introduce all the characters individually later, um, so hopefully that will make things um, less confusing. Now, um, the third kingdom, I don't know if it really counts as a kingdom, but I'll just call it that anyway. Um, it doesn't have a king and a queen. It is essentially just ruled by the other two kingdoms. Um, however, it consists of a bunch of noble families that work for the king and queen and basically reign over this kingdom. It is called Inglamark, which basically means angel grounds. Uh, this name comes from a song, a uh, Swedish song by Sven Bertil Taub. I can link it in the description if I remember to. <laughs> um, now, this uh, kingdom is very like flat and very bare. It is essentially used for harvesting crops and like just farming in general. It also has a pretty rich um, fishing life since it is by the coast. So this, I would say this kingdom is the most resourceful, like it, it provides the country with the most products, the most things and the most goods basically. So this third kingdom is essentially just grounds for farming 
and fishing, which is the reason why there's no king and queen here. Um, there's not really any land that you would want to live on. It's all just kind of industrial and farmy. <laughs> I feel like I'm not explaining this very well, but you know. So um, basically these like families that are placed in this kingdom, I think there are four or three, <laughs> but I don't really remember. They just oversee this entire kingdom and all the farming and such. And again, they basically work for the king and queen and in return they get like fancy houses and lots of money and stuff. Now, this country uh, with its three kingdoms and its rich history and everything is um, very dystopian-like, I would say. The crown has absolute power. Um, there are no politicians, no democracy, no nothing. There are execution and life imprisonment sentences for like small things. Everything that doesn't um, immediately like nurture the crown is considered bad. So I've actually built up a very, I think, interesting discrimination system. Um, and these are obviously subjects that will arise because um, I have characters of different races, different ethnicities, different you know, sexualities. So these are issues that will have to be, you know, discussed within the book. So essentially, there is no racism um, in this country. Not just because I wanted to be, you know, progressive and everything, but because um, how hard a person can work and how much they can contribute to the crown isn't affected at all by their race. And um, there is a religion in this country, but it's not, like, very big. I've kind of based this off of how Sweden um, is. Because <laughs> Sweden is a Christian country, but not many Swedes are believers. Like, actually believe in God and go to church regularly and such. And I'm thinking there's, like, a similar um, situation in this country. Basically, the crown and the king and queens have just taken over... And they're all that matters. So no god is really more important than them. That's that's kind of the society they've built up. So that being said, there's no religion setting the morals of the people. So there's no like, oh, I'm homophobic because God said so. No, um, God didn't say that, first of all. And second of all, they wouldn't care if he did. <laughs> So essentially, any discrimination or anything like that is purely based off of whether who you are um, benefits the crown or not. I don't know if I'm explaining things in a good way at all. I feel like I'm just ranting, but I guess that's what this video is. So, um, back on track. Racism doesn't exist here because it doesn't affect the way you work and how you can contribute to the crown. However, there is sexism, ableism and homophobia um number one is sexism is because you know the crown wants you to reproduce so that they can have more inhabitants in the country that can work for them and make them more money obviously and obviously it has to be women who give birth and when they've given birth they need time to rest so the crown recommends for men to be out doing hard labor and working because if they damage themselves in some way like um they can most likely still reproduce at least you know meanwhile women i mean obviously if they're like in a like a big accident or something they might not be able to reproduce and also once they've given birth they have to recover for a period of time and then the crown needs someone a man to work while this is happening However, the crown is not against women working because at the end of the day, you know, more labor is more labor. So there are women in powerful positions in the army, you know, there are women in every, like, every single job. And um, I would say they're paid just the same as men. Um, not a lot. <laughs> but essentially, um, yeah, there are some differences and men are definitely valued over women um, work-wise, but it's 
definitely not the same kind of discrimination that is in some countries where like women can't go to school and women like women can essentially do the same things as men it's just that they they are still discriminated against and still treated as kind of baby machines ish basically baby machines with a potential to also work which is just fucked up you know then there is um obviously classism um most citizens are in the lower class there's no like real classism like oh workers farmers you know not like that like everyone is basically on the same level except for the noble families and the royal houses obviously so essentially everyone in this country is poor except the very rich um and then there's of course ableism if you are disabled um you might not be able to work or at least work as hard as um an able-bodied person and you will be discriminated against because of this by the crown you can get thrown out of your house you may be out of an income and you're essentially going to be left to die there like there's no you know mobility aids or anything the the crown doesn't care about that and they don't they don't want to make waste their money on that which is obviously horrible but essentially this in the system you're just valued based on what you can do in physical labor and um sadly i think that is the way it is in our real world as well um to some extent so yeah there there is definitely um ableism and it it's sad and of course there is the question of sexuality um and like gender nonconformity and stuff like that now um sexuality wise there's no law against homosexuality again because there's no like dominating religion that kind of steers everyone's moral and religion is often the source for hate against lgbtq plus persons there's no like direct law against it the crown doesn't want to waste energy on trying to arrest people because they're gay you know however it is very taboo obviously because um the crown again wants you to reproduce and if you don't reproduce you're kind of considered as a person that doesn't contribute as much as you could so not illegal but taboo and there's definitely homophobia prominent um I would kind of say the same things about um, being like trans and stuff in this world. I haven't explored that very thoroughly in this book. um, But I'm thinking if you're born as one gender and you feel like another or you don't feel like any gender at all or you know. I don't think the crown is going to take much notice or care. I think again it probably is pretty taboo. Since the system kind of um, puts you a lot of like expectations on you gender wise, but it's there's no loss against it. Like there's um, no one who is gonna arrest you because you want to be a woman or you feel like a woman, you know. But um, I would say it's definitely taboo, and if you don't reproduce and stuff, there's gonna be that taboo on you as well. Also, obviously, there's no, no like. Um, healthcare or anything for people who are trans um like you won't be able to get any surgeries or therapy or anything that you might need which is obviously incredibly tragic but um in this country it's again it's very dystopian there's basically not enough doctors for people who get hurt or anything so if you want um to like visit the doctor or something for your own like mental health or something that's not going to be taken seriously and that that is obviously a, a shame <laughs> so that is basically like the entire like basically the crown doesn't care about its residents they just care about what they can produce and what they can do for them um so all of the inhabitants of this country are poor and have very bad life expectancy and that is basically what this princess and this prince wants to fight they don't like the way their parents rule this country I also have an idea um, that this country, compared to other other countries in this fictional world, um, is very behind, like, technologically and everything. So, essentially, in the neighboring countries, even, they have democracy. Like, they might have still a crown, but they're just not, like, 
leaders like that. You know, for example, in Sweden right now, we have parliament, we have um, democracy, and essentially the king and queen don't have any power. They just hold a kind of symbolic value. This is what the neighboring countries of Oros have. They have democracy and they have, I'm thinking, about the same technology as the real world, our world, had in like the 1910s or the 1920s. So they have phones, they have cars, you know. Basically, the rest of the world is going through the industrial revolution. Meanwhile, Autos, where our story takes place, is stuck in the early 1800s. Like, technology and moral wise <laughs> i don't know if that makes sense but that is the world building that i have been doing so far and obviously there's there's like much more but you know um one key thing that i have neglected to mention this far is the trolls now um i don't know how long i've gotten into the speed paint as you're hearing this but um all the way to the right there is a character that is a troll. She's my favorite character and I love her. And the trolls themselves, there's like a whole thing. It, it, they have their own lore, definitely. But I'm thinking we'll get back into that later as we discuss that character specifically. So, <laughs> I have babbled on for a long time. Um, so, let's get into the characters individually. We will start with Maria, since she is the main character. So, Maria's parents are Anna and Gustav um, of Berjadal. Now, um, Anna is a very strict mother. Meanwhile, Gustav is a bit more allowing, I would say. Now, um, Maria is an only child, and it shows. She is very wild and demands a lot of attention as a child she likes to run around and play as children do but since she's a princess her parents want her to kind of keep up an appearance you know keep her fancy clothes nice and tidy but that's not her thing she likes to run and run and run and just never stop running this is a consistent thing with her character throughout the entire book that if something happens her main instinct is to just run and not stop until she is super tired <laughs> and she would do this a lot as a kid or her parents or her mom specifically would scold her a lot because she didn't behave how she was expected to behave and she would just run out into the forest or out into the city um so eventually her parents got her a chambermaid to obviously help help her with her personal hygiene um getting dressed whatever but also to kind of give her a playmate that would maybe calm her down a little bit. Now this girl's name is Saga. Um, she is a peasant from the city. And she's with Maria as she grows up. And eventually when they reach like 13, 14 years of age, they start secretly dating each other. Now Saga isn't a very big part of the storyline, so I'm not going to talk that much about her, but... She has a pretty dark background. Um, she comes from the slums, basically. A lot of the servants in the castle are people who the queen has quote-unquote rescued from the slum of the city. Um, Maria's mom kind of has this idea that people who are very poor and live on the streets are better off as servants in the castle where they can get food and a roof over their heads. Although, obviously, she is using them for labor, and that's not very cool, and she's not paying them. She's just paying them in housing and um, food and maybe, like, a small amount, which is basically slavery. Um, she at least likes to think that this is um, a service she's doing. Them. And uh, meanwhile, I mean, Maria is very small at this point, so she doesn't really understand the concept of slavery or being poor <laughs> that is also a thing with maria she's very naive because of her upbringing um her parents doesn't teach her a lot of things aside from um obviously like reading writing how to run a kingdom but this is kind of a continuous thing throughout the book that the king and queens don't really tell their children everything only like some things um that they need to know growing up um, I think 
their plan in my mind at least the king and queen's plans are basically to tell them the more not so good stuff when they get old enough to be close to taking over the throne so when the story you know starts out and the the king and kings and queens are you know middle aged and um the prince and princess are in their early 20s they don't know much that is a thing again throughout this book that maria is very naive to how the world looks around her like outside of the castle walls she knows that a lot of the inhabitants of the country are poor she knows that they have to work long days and long nights but she doesn't know how bad the homeless have it she doesn't even know that there are a lot of homeless people she doesn't know how the country like treats their disabled she she's very naive basically and obviously at no fault of her own i mean it's her parents fault but um anyway she's also very stubborn um she has she basically finds out what she thinks is right and then she goes with it no matter what other people say and that is something i admire in her because i kind of have a lack of that characteristic i can be pretty stubborn but i tend to kind of confide to what other people think and feel um and internalize that we meanwhile maria is very headstrong she's like she if she finds out what she wants then that's what she wants but at the same time she's also very open to like new ideas she's very progressive which is a huge contrast to her mother who's very conservative and very strict um maria is actually based on a old oc i had named katya i essentially wrote or i was going to write a book i and i think i started it when i was like 11 um but since 11 to like 13 14 is a very is it's an it's an age where you develop very fast um i would you know work on this project on and off and <laughs> eventually when i was 14 you know all the stuff i had written as an 11 year old i had to rewrite or scrap because an 11 year old wrote that you know so eventually i just scrapped the whole project because it was such a mish- mishmash of stuff i wrote at a very young age to an older age and it just didn't really work together but anyway the main character of that is katya and she was also kind of a headstrong girl who knew what she wanted and such so i have kind of taken parts of her personality and applied it to maria so that i could actually have this character in some form <laughs> without having to scrap her you know in her whole so anyway i i think that's all i wanted to say about maria you know you can see how she looks in the speed paint so i don't think there's any point in describing her like that oh um one more thing maria is impulsive that is also a thing that is kind of important for the story again with her just like running from things she's very impulsive she like get she's in the moment um she gets a whim like i have to do this and then she just does it sometimes it turns out great and sometimes it doesn't (laughs) But anyway, let's move on to the next character. I hope you got kind of a picture of Maria, because um, I, I rant a lot. So, But anyway, let's move on to the next character, Philip. He is a prince. He is the prince of Skogemark. His parents are Christina and Henrik, um, king and queen of Skogemark. Now, um, even though he grew up in the kingdom next to Maria and they met frequently as children, because the kingdoms are in alliance with each other, he had a very different upbringing than Maria. Maria did have a strict mother, but she didn't come anywhere close to Philip's mother. So, so Skogemark, as previously mentioned, is definitely the most powerful kingdom of the three. And um, this is because... The king and queen of Skogemark, Christina and Henrik, are very, very ruthless with the way they rule. They are the ones who keep pushing the um, residents of Aros harder and harder. They give them less and less money for more and more labor. They're basically the reason why the crown has such um, power within the country. Every time there's like a slight uprising, a bunch of people are immediately executed. You know, they make examples of them. It's like 
medieval style torture and um execution they're very very hard and um basically um maria's parents anna and gustav are not big fans of them they're scared of them basically when maria and philip were small they would visit each other all the time and gustav and anna would always just agree with everything henrik and christina said um because they didn't dare to do anything else so philip was raised much more strict than maria even though maria's mother was already pretty strict but essentially the things maria did in her household that maybe resulted in a slight scolding would result in um slaps uh, and just child abuse essentially in philip's household so philip is the oldest of two brothers he has a little brother called Cod. So basically, unlike Maria, he has a sibling. Now, Philip is essentially very soft-spoken and um, obedient, essentially, to what his parents are telling him to do. He likes to stay inside, he likes to read, he likes to just take it as it is. And, you know, he studies, he's very cunning and wise. He's basically like me as a child, if I had been smart. (laughs) But anyway, he's like the stark contrast to Maria. And so the two don't really get along very well when they're children. But um, they kind of grow to like each other more when they're, they get older and then they mature a bit more. Now, um, Carl, Philip's younger brother, is um, a bit more like Maria. He's very like, you know, he likes running around, playing, just being a normal child, wrecking stuff. Um, but he's also very sick he can get very sick um now i don't know exactly what disease he's supposed to have if it's supposed to be fictional or if it's something real but i'm thinking it's some kind of autoimmune disease something that he's born with and that makes him very vulnerable to like a a normal cold essentially i'm thinking that his immune system is very weak and he easily gets very sick from like things that other people would not get that sick from and so a lot of pressure is obviously on philip to take over the throne because he's the oldest and he's you know healthy and although he seems calm and collected at pretty much all times there is this immense pressure on him from a very young age that he's kind of cracking to and then of course he grows up and discovers that he is gay and um things kind of escalate from there later on in the story um he kind of finds his voice a little more and um kind of discovers that he's very good at speaking and communicating verbally so he's very good at motivating people and making them feel seen with his voice um and stuff like that um moving on to the next character we have Björn. Uh, Björn means bear in swedish and in case you didn't know it's the same name that pewdiepie named his son <laughs> But anyway, um, Björn is a very complicated character because he is not a good person, but um, he's still friends with the main characters and he's still part of the major plot. So basically, he was born on a farm um, in the mountains. I'm thinking it's like a goat's farm or something. So he's from Berjadal, just like Maria. Anyway, his home life was not good at all. His mother died in childbirth and his father never really liked him because of it. Plus, he's a very bitter man and I don't really think he ever wanted children. So, long story short, he was abusive and Björn ran from home at 14 years old. Now, I won't go into detail about what happens next in his story. One, because I don't want to spoil you too much. I want this to kind of be spoiler-free and kind of neutral. But also because some of the things that happens to him are kind of too horrible for YouTube. But um, basically, after leaving his home, he goes through many traumatic events that leaves him traumatized. He ends up going to a little island off the coast of Aros. It's um, conveniently called Fiskeram, which means fishing island. There he is allowed to live in a fisherman's shed for 
I don't know how long, like two years. So he lives in a wet, cold, stinking shed for like two years um, and helps with the fishing and stuff in exchange for food and, well, the shed and some money. Anyway, eventually he gets enough of this and I think it's about this age that he realizes that he is gay. Yes, a lot of people are gay in my book. <laughs> Basically only side characters are straight. <laughs> but anyway, Bjorn moves to a village in Skogemark where he starts working for a blacksmith who doesn't have a son of his own. And it's when he works and lives in this village that he meets Astrid. She's a local girl and despite knowing that he's most likely gay and not attracted to women, he ends up marrying her um, for selfish reasons. Number one, he wants to look normal, as normal as possible. Um, there was pressure from some other inhabitants of the village because Astrid was very clearly, clearly interested in him. And also he wanted to kind of experiment and see if he could live with a woman which is again very selfish of him um to bind her by marriage just to kind of experiment with his own sexuality eventually um someone else takes over the blacksmith job so Bjorn starts working as a soldier at the castle in Skogemark um and as you might remember that's where Philip lives with his family. So Bjorn meets Philip. Bjorn is a lot older than Philip. Um, like, Philip is about 18, 19, and he's like, what, 25? And they enter a relationship together. Now, Bjorn did not know Philip's age when they started dating, but he knew he was younger and he knew he was naive. And at the same time, he's cheating on his wife, and who he by now has kids with. And so basically, his and Philip's relationship isn't at all healthy. They're both just hooking up regularly. Bjorn doesn't like to discuss his feelings. There is an age difference that isn't all that good. And there's also a power dynamic of Philip being a prince and Bjorn being a soldier and a personnel at his castle. Basically, a lot of things are wrong with their relationship, and um, it ends up with Philip discovering that Bjorn is cheating on his wife, and he breaks up with him. Now, the reason I tell you this is because this is something that has already happened when the story begins, and um, you get introduced to it pretty quickly, so that's why I'm kind of putting that spoiler out there, even though I said there wouldn't be that many spoilers Basically, I'm trying to tell the main story as it is when this like when the book starts, but I won't go like into further detail in that. So anyway, yeah, safe to say Bjorn is a very complicated and not so good character, but that's in my opinion what makes him so interesting to work with. The main characters choose to forgive him and give him a chance to kind of become a better person but that is in no way a thing that you as a reader has to do you can hate him all you want because i mean if you do he does deserve it and i think that's what's so interesting about him is that i know that if people read this someday hopefully i know some will probably think that he can improve and become a better person and some people will think that what he has done is completely unforgivable and I think both things are valid in their own ways. That is what's so interesting to me about complex characters. Um, you can like them or hate them and like nothing is wrong, you know? Now the next person we're going to move on to is Ingevald. He is like Bjorn, a soldier at the castle, but um, he's a bit younger. I think he's supposed to be about a year younger than Philip, but I don't remember exactly. Um, for reference, also, Philip is 20 or 21 when the story starts. So Ingevald is about 19, 18, somewhere there. So Ingevald was born in a small village in the woods, like most people, um, in Skogemark, and he has a mother and a sister 
His father passed away before his sister was born. From an early age, he was taught that he had to provide for the family. And so as soon as he turned 18, he enrolled to become a soldier at the castle. This is where he meets Philip and they start dating. I would say Ingvald is a very open-minded person. He is religious. It doesn't like define who he is as a person, but he does pray and he does believe that things happen for a reason. He likes people and he likes caring for them and he has a tendency to kind of give everyone a chance even though they might not deserve it. And uh, he likes to paint. <laughs> so um, his relationship with Philip is obviously healthier than the relationship between Philip and Bjorn. There is still a power dynamic going on, but they grow each other way closer than Philip and Bjorn did. So Philip um, attempts to make him into his own personal servant um, towards the beginning of the story. And he succeeds, so Ingvald gets to work very close to him, which obviously still not bringing them on an equal level, but as equal as possible. And then, of course, later in the story, Philip, spoiler alert, <laughs> loses his title as prince. So then they can begin really getting to know each other at the same level. He is sadly, I think, kind of one of my less developed characters he's a bit of an afterthought which is a bit sad because <laughs> i like him but i feel like i might be able to add more when i have finished the book in its entirety and i go back and i edit everything i might be able to add more little moments of him i just have a hard time seeing him specifically until the entire thing is finished you know because he does have his place in the story and everything. I just like... His personality is just hard to describe for me. And I don't know why. But um, anyway, let's move on to the last and my favorite character. I am so excited to talk, to talk about her. Um, I'm sorry. Like, this video will probably turn out to be an hour. We're already going on 47 minutes. But I just... Uh, I just love her so much. So, her name is Svea. And she is a troll. Now, before we start talking more in depth about her specifically, we kind of have to go through the lore of trolls in my book. So essentially, my trolls are based on trolls in Nordic mythology, specifically the way Jon Bauer portrays them. I can put a um, picture on screen. He was a Swedish artist during the late 1800s and early 1900s. My depiction of trolls are also based on the Swedish artist Rolf Lidberg's illustrations. He has made um, sculptures, cards, paintings, and children's books about trolls. Um, I grew up with some of these children's books and I always used to love them, so they inspire me a lot. Anyway, with that out of the way, the trolls as a species in my book um, are family to humans. Basically, thousands and thousands of years ago, some humans started building and living in huts and such and started creating machines and all kinds of things to help them live. Meanwhile, some other humans decided to keep living in nature with what they had got. And so basically, the two different groups of humans developed differently. The first group who started creating machines and tools and huts and all that started losing hair and they grew smaller because they didn't need to be as big and warm. Meanwhile, the second group who stayed out in nature got stronger teeth and two bigger teeth in their lower jaw. So basically, they have small tusks. This, of course, helps them to open shells, like on nuts and stuff, scrape off fat from skins, and just all kinds of things. They're also larger, and as time progressed and the trolls moved to different parts of the world, they've also started developing um, different skin colors and appearances to kind of blend in with where they are. 
The trolls in my book obviously live in Oros, and they look slightly different depending on what kingdom they live in. Those who live in the mountains are more grayish and tend to be a bit bigger and bulkier to kind of pass off as rocks. Um, and this is once again inspired by Jon Bauer's art. The trolls living in Skogemark in the woods have a more greenish color to them. They also um, obviously dress in materials that are available where they live. So, for example, the mountain trolls will be dressed in sheep's wool and wolf skins. And um, the Skogemark trolls who lives in the woods will wear bear coats, wolf coats, stuff like that. Then the third type of trolls are the ones living by the coast in Englemark. Since Englemark is so bare and covered with humans and fields, there are not many places to hide, so they live by the coast. They also have kind of a grayish tint to them, and they live off of fish, nearby animals, and things accidentally dropped by humans from the boats. Now, you may ask, why are the trolls hiding? As I mentioned, there are trolls living around the whole world, um, and some of them live quite happily. I'm thinking there is an island where there are only trolls living. But since these trolls live in Aros, and Ar Aros is very disconnected from the rest of the world due to the way the queens and kings keep the rest of the world away, the trolls in Aros do not know if there are other trolls in the world. Which is obviously a very horrible thing to be experiencing, to not know whether you're the last of your species or not. And um, trolls are at the risk of extinction in Autos. Because trolls have this special connection to nature that humans have too, but they've kind of forgotten they have it. Once again, I've been inspired by Nordic mythology and runestones. The trolls have these places where there are rune stones adorned with runes of an ancient language. And if they sit on the runes and speak certain words, they can gain a connection with nature. This connection essentially allows them to get a kind of a thermal vision-ish. They can see people's auras, they can detect if someone is nearby, they can basically feel the nature around them and see if someone is there, someone is walking on it, etc. This power also allows them to heal people. And they cannot bring people back from the dead, but if you have an injury or if you're about to die from something, they may be able to heal you. Now, this power is, as I said, kind of forgotten by the humans. And so only the trolls have access to it and still know how to use it. This makes them a threat to the crown and to humans overall, at least um, in the queen's opinion. So for hundreds and hundreds of years, kings and queens for generations have been hunting the trolls and killing them. So the current king and queen are terrified of trolls. They have warned their kids about them, and essentially the humans of Aros barely even know they exist. It is a constant legend that parents tell their children, but there are very few people who still believe they exist. That is how hard the crown for generations have tried to cover their existence up. But basically the current queen of Skogamark, Christina, is terrified of them because she knows they exist, she has seen them, and she has ordered her guards to kill them herself. So, this brings us back to Svea. When she was a child, she was living in Berjadal, and most trolls were living in Berjadal. At this point, the trolls were moving around a lot, so they were kind of switching from Berjadal to Skogemark and so on. This is why Svea is green, because her descendants came from the forest. So, when Svea was a child, Someone in her group, sadly, was seen by a human. This led to the human shooting one of them and reporting the rest to the crown. 
Now, um, the queen of Valladolid was, of course, Anna Maria's mom, and she didn't quite know what to do, so she contacted Christina. Now, Christina is, as I said before, very ruthless in the way she rules and decides things. So she immediately dictated that all the trolls in the mountains and everywhere else will be killed. Before this, um, the hunting of trolls had been ongoing, but not to an extreme level. The crown basically assumed that most trolls, if not all, were dead because the trolls had gotten really good at hiding throughout all these years. But now they were discovered in a large group again, and so there was this whole frenzy. And all of this happened unbeknownst to the human population of Autos. The only ones who knew were the crowns and some select soldiers that went out to hunt them. Now, neither Maria or Philip was told about this because they were very small when this happened. So when the story begins, they are completely oblivious to this. Basically, this hunt results in most of the trolls evacuating to the thickly wooded areas of Skogemark, and lots of trolls died, more than half of the ones existing up in the mountains. Now, Svea's parents survive, but some of her friends weren't as lucky. Some of their parents die, and so they are raised by the other remaining trolls from a young age, which obviously traumatizes them deeply. So the trolls are essentially kind of like an ethnic group that are being severely hunted, just like, sadly, many ethnic groups are in real life. Although um, the trolls bear obvious connections to many real ethnic groups, I want to stress that the trolls are not based on any specific real ethnic group. Um, I feel like I have to say this because I don't want anybody thinking I'm trying to represent a real ethnic group with these trolls. One, because I'm not, like, educated enough to represent any group in that sort of way. And two, because I have created these trolls with no real ethnic group in mind, stereotypes and stuff like that that may connect to real ethnic groups might occur in unintentionally because, I again, I haven't had any real ethnic group in mind. So I just wanted to put that out there that the trolls are entirely fictional and not based on any real group of people. Anyway, back to the character herself, Svea. Now, Svea is very calm and collected. She's good at giving advice and she brings a sense of security and safety to the people and trolls around her. Now, she is very tall <laughs> compared to humans. She is 203 centimeters or 2 meters and 3 centimeters. Now, if there are any Americans listening, that is about 6 foot 8. Now, obviously, this isn't a ridiculous height. A person can easily be this tall, but she's very tall in comparison to most human women. Um, but compared to other trolls, she's like average height. Now, Svia is, like most other trolls, very protective of her family and her friends and trolls in general. But at the same time, she has this curiosity that most other trolls don't have. Where they are scared, she's curious. And although she's very aware of the history of her people and that, you know, humans are very dangerous to them, she still holds this small belief that maybe all humans aren't all that horrible. And that's kind of what ends up bringing her into this story that I'm writing. Um, she becomes friends with Maria first and then the rest of the crew. And then a bunch of stuff happens <laughs> that I won't talk about here. But long story short, she becomes part of the main characters. And she is my favorite character. <laughs> I love her so much. I think she's so beautiful. And I just, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was um my rant about my characters. Um, there is obviously so much more to say. I mean, it's a whole book. I've reached well over a thousand pages at this point. Um, but the the point of this video wasn't to go through the entire plot of the book. The point was to give you kind of an idea of the world building and the setting and the characters. So hopefully this video that is now 
almost an hour long, um, gave you that information. I don't know how coherent I have been throughout this video. I had a loose script, but I, yeah, I went off it pretty quickly. I'm not that good at following scripts when it comes to stuff like this. <laughs> but anyway, sorry for the video being so incredibly long. I hope some of it made sense, and I hope to see you in a future video. <laughs> Goodbye, and thanks for listening.